Hey, everybody. <laughs> Good afternoon and welcome to The Take Up. It's episode 14, Capitalizing on Creativity. Uh, as you may have noticed, I'm having a little bit of uh, technical issues yet again this time. I don't know if we're having a trouble with uh, StreamYard or having a trouble with something else going on uh, as far as internet connections or something. But if you see a little bit of slowdown or see that I'm in low resolution right now, uh, I've been trying to get this to uh, go a little more speedily and have, have less of this slowdown and stutter. Um, if we've had some trouble with that, I do apologize. But uh, for everybody who's checking in, I sincerely appreciate you being here today. We're going to talk all about creativity and really creativity as it affects your bottom line and some stories, particularly about how I've used creativity in my career. Uh, um, show a couple samples and discuss uh, what I feel is important about creativity and about uh, using it in order to secure business and secure clients and what it does for you. Uh, we have many ways is going to go throughout the hour, and but let's just go ahead and start getting into what we have so far. But let's just jump in and say hi to the people who are coming in on chat. First, we have Matthew. Uh, you're going to get me to say this. So, uh, Howdly doodly. There we go. <laughs> a little bit of like channeling Ned Flanders there, folks. Thanks. Thanks, Matthew. Uh, Matt. Here's uh, Mike. Mike Will Downey. Always glad to see you here. Hey, hey, hey. Hey to you too. Christine. Hey. By the way, if you haven't noticed yet, you have to go to christineshreve.com. She has launched Christine Shreve Consulting. So there's some really great stuff for um, media, social media, writing, marketing. Great stuff from Christine coming out. So watch out what she's doing there. Tom Farr, Buzzard Bay Embroidery. Tom Farr doing some great work with masks, and that is awesome. Uh, Jeff showing up. Jeff, hello, ready to learn some cool stuff. Jeff, you already do cool stuff. You probably don't need to be here, man. <laughs> but still, great to have you here. Just our minute, a happy Friday. Happy Friday to you, Justin. Uh, hi, good to see Heather here. Alan Howe. All, Alan Howe, Easy Way Systems. Always awesome to have Alan around. Got to see his Q&A with Marshall Atkinson earlier. Great stuff this morning. Uh, right after the two regular guys. If you haven't checked that out, two regular guys this morning, great things about what we should do to be getting ready to come back to uh, some version of normalcy here. So we'll have to see how that turns out. Uh, Ramona, uh, just means long to be with you. Oh, that's so nice, Ramona. Thank you very much. Yeah, we'll have some more time. Hopefully we don't go into super bonus time because the other thing I'm trying to do here, folks, not only am I trying to keep to an hour for uh, my sanity and yours having to listen to me for so long, uh, but I'm also trying to get it down to an hour so I can start sharing these things on Instagram. I've had some people who have asked me to share in different channels. Instagram TV is a place I've been starting to share these things, but they have to be down to an hour to fit. You can't have more than an hour to be one episode. So we'll have to see how that all turns out. But I'm happy to be with you for as long as I can because, you know, this is what I like to do. Uh, Heather says, good night. Cindy King, hi from Odessa. Hello, Cindy. Happy to see you here. Mark Woods, sup? Jorita, hello from Austin. Hello, Jorita. Jorita is awesome. Embroidery works very artistic, very creative stuff. And once again, good. Was Alan, Christine, congrats. She's amazing. And there, Christine, if you haven't seen in the comments, go check her out at christineshreve.com. Thank you for mentioning it. She says, well, thank you for doing all you do. So great stuff. And inside joke here with Matt, uh, you'll never guess what I'm doing, Eric. Butterfly maintenance. His butterfly machine... Uh, it doesn't run the best. I'm not going to say anything about particular brands necessarily, but that particular machine, whether or not it's endemic of the entire brand, uh, has some issues, folks. So <laughs> I think he's always doing butterfly maintenance. I, that's that's something that I, I've heard him doing a lot of. Uh, but, you know, hey, maintenance, good for your machines. Uh, you should do that whenever necessary and possible. But, um, you know, good to have a machine that doesn't need a ton of maintenance, too. All right, folks. So let's get into this. What were we talking about? Capitalizing on creativity, right? This is something that we need to uh, discuss, not just because creativity is cool. Hey, I'm an artistic person, or at least I like to think I am. I like to do creative things. I like to do work that is in and of itself interesting to me. And part of that means that I'm going to do uh, creative work. I want to do something different. If you've seen me, especially, let's say, if um, if you have gone to one of my classes, let's say you've taken the demystifying digitizing, that next level digitizing webinar where I talk about texture, where I talk about carving, where I talk about surfaces, you guys know that I will get deep into the weeds on being creative. The thing is, those creative solutions, everybody will also come to me and say, hey, man, really? Did you you spend all that time carving out, like, let's say that heart of a lion jacket, which if you look that up, everybody's kind of seen that sample out there where I took this lion's head that had uh, a big black splash in the back of the art. There was no detail in the back of it at all. And I carved it out into individual loops of hair into the mane and, and everything was done in satin stitches instead of fills. And everybody's generally seeing that. The first thing they say is, wow, I like that. I'd like to do something like that. The second thing is, is that really worth the money? Did somebody pay you to do that? Um, truth of the matter, yes, yes, they paid me to do that. Um, partially because they wanted something different. They were worth 
it was worth it to them to pay for the value. However, um, that's the question I often get whenever I show people, let's say blending, color blending, where I do very uh, detailed blends, but they are time consuming, sometimes done manually, stitch by stitch, but for a, a small high gamut blend of like say a rainbow of colors, sometimes that's the best or only way to get one density solid blending where all the ratios between the colors are exactly where you want them. The thing is, everybody says, hey, can you actually make your bottom line work with that? Is that paying you or is this a craft project? And as much as I may jump to my own defense, because I have made a lot of money on these things, uh, I will say, yeah, it's easy to get into these craft projects, projects that are fun for us, that are creative for us, but aren't paying the bills. The thing is, creativity does have a lot for you that can pay the bills. And uh, I'm actually going to go both into sort of the news section of these stories and into what we're going to cover today with that by jumping to my other screen here. And I'm going to show you what is uh, sadly uh, the last of my articles for Printware Magazine. But before you get too particularly upset about this, um, Printware Magazine is indeed leaving. There will be no more Printware Magazine uh, shortly. So if you are a fan of Printware, this is a kind of a bittersweet time for you as it is for me and uh, Christine also who has written for Printware quite a bit. Um, Printware Magazine is going away. However, before I even jump into this, uh, there is a new magazine coming from the people from NBM called Graphics Pro. And uh, I will be in Graphics Pro. It may not be every month like I was in the original column because they do mix up all the different kinds of graphics and decoration in the one magazine. Uh, but I will be regular every other month for sure and potentially every month depending on uh, how that magazine goes and how uh, it is supported by both advertisers and uh, those of you who subscribe. So uh, Graphics Pro is coming. Don't get too, too upset. But this is, you are looking at my last article for Printware Magazine. Uh, and I can already feel like I'm, I'm, I'm about ready to go out and embroider myself a Printware hat and wear it around in solidarity. I, I will miss Printware quite a bit. It was uh, fantastic to be a part of it. And I'm actually going to bring that comment in for Frank here. Sad to see it go. Yeah, me too, Frank. I really am sad to see that go. It was, uh, it was an awesome magazine, uh, very much dedicated to education. And I love it. You will still see me in other magazines. Like I said, Graphics Pro coming up soon. So go look for Graphics Pro and uh, follow that stuff for sure. You want to see... Uh, uh, graphics pro people coming together you're going to find like say two other guys you follow two other guys you may if you're here with me today uh you'll see aaron montgomery is going to be in graphics pro as well with me so we're all a lot of the people who wrote for printware who wrote for um awards the award magazines that they did you're going to see them come back in graphics pro but to this note here we're going to go into my last article here and it's entitled the amazing niche um and we, there, if you'll see, there's not a lot of my work in the pictures. Uh, it turned out we had some scheduling issues with this last article, and so they used some stock imagery as well. But I'm going to go into some other designs of my own later, since I do tend to like to show you my stuff, so uh, we can tear that up if so. Uh, by the way, Christine Shreve doing an awesome job as my uh, ad hoc producer, I suppose, today. She's gone, went ahead and put in uh, Graphics Pro Mag, so yeah, facebook.com slash graphics pro mag. Go over there, follow their social media, and you'll be able to find us as we transition over to Graphics Pro. And I already know, actually, I already have my assignment. I know what I'm going on now. It's not just yet. That magazine will be, uh, I believe, next month. But I already know what my first assignment is for Graphics Pro. So trust me, guys, it's stuff you've been asking me about. Uh, people who've been asking me for some classes, uh, some of that stuff's coming out, and Graphics Pro has been listening. Anyway, so this particular article is called uh, The Amazing Niche, How to Capitalize on Creativity. It's one of the reasons I brought this up, but it actually does come up quite frequently. People come to my technical classes and invariably we end up uh, in the same sort of space where they're saying, hey, can you get paid for this? Can you get paid for doing these detailed pieces of work? Can you get paid for digitizing this stuff? And absolutely you can. But here's the thing that people are, are going into. You have to kind of understand what that creativity you apply to your designs will do for you. I mean, it's not, it is not 100%. If I do more creative work, if I do more detailed work, if I do uh, more artistic work, that I will invariably make more money. That is not entirely the case. You have to understand how you're applying that. And you have to understand that sometimes the creative work isn't actually part of the direct sale you're working on too. There are other reasons to do it. So let's go ahead and go through some of the key elements here. And then I'm going to talk about a couple of jobs, actual jobs that I did, uh, pieces that uh, may have appeared in magazines as well, but pieces that I did that were off of the production line. In fact, I'm going to jump back to this just for a second and say this. Um, 
those of you who have been in the embroidery industry long enough to, to know from back in the day when there were a lot of digitizing contests, uh, now really uh, impressions is kind of the only uh, game it, out there now. But back in the day, there were uh, digitizing embroidery contests in a lot of the magazines and people entered these. And actually how I became who I am, if you want to call it that, uh, as far as doing media and writing and everything else was that I was a contest winner. Uh, primarily in Stitches magazine back in the day. And so some of these pieces and all of my pieces, they actually came from jobs. All the pieces that I won our awards on uh, were off of the production line. None of them were done for an award. Uh, whereas you may see that some people are putting out a lot of work into things. I know back in the day, the, <laughs> the watchword was always, hey, how many hours did you really put into this contest entry? Like how much time did you actually spend doing this? Because we would have pieces where there were just hundreds of thousands of stitches. They were uh, detailed and designed and digitized in crazy ways. And they were embroidered over a massive amount of the surface or had lots of, uh, you know, appended multimedia, stuff like that. Things that were very difficult to justify in an actual order. And so for myself, I always entered pieces that were specifically from my production line. And the things that we're going to talk about today are from my production line as well, because I do thoroughly believe that this creativity does apply to your bottom line does apply to things that you can do uh, in an actual job situation. Anyway, let's go over some of the points that I brought up in this article so that we can kind of, you know, discuss this. Number one, right? Customers pay for the value they perceive, right? So the perception of value, we talk about this all the time. The perception of value is what it is. When someone perceives something to be valuable, what they are willing to pay for a thing is what it's worth to a great degree. Now, certainly we can discuss, you know, the actual value versus perceived value, actual value being where you add actual utility to a garment. It has some value in and of itself that is provable. It is, if, if a garment is made with fire resistant material for, for uh, one point, let's say then it is much more valuable than that isn't if the person needs that fire resistant material. But no matter what kind of value we're talking about, it is only as valuable as it has fitness for the situation that the customer finds themselves in. Uh, your garment is as valuable as it is to them at the given moment, right? So customers pay for value they perceive. And what I'm gonna say is that creativity can feed into this value-based pricing, right? Value is not solely defined, as it says here, by plugging data into a spreadsheet you can have something be worth more if the customer perceives it as being worth more. And part of that is novelty. So if you have novelty, if you can delight the customer, if you can show them something they haven't seen before, or if you have something like detail is one of these things. When I talk about carving or dimension, where we take a big slab of something that would be fill and break it up into individual elements and let the light play over the surfaces of these different satin stitches or elements or textures, that is delightful. It is like people who look at miniatures. Why do people look at like train sets and miniatures and things like that? They see these little details and these pieces of design that were thought out and they are delighted by this stuff. It is something that's interesting to them. They want to think about the process. They enjoy that. Also, why previous to the crisis we find ourselves in now, why was live embroidery, live uh screen printing especially popular for a while there and really gaining traction part of it was because there was delight in the knowledge of the process and in the experience did it make the plastisol on the t-shirt that the screen printer printed worth more materially that someone saw it or got it from an event that they attached that to absolutely not and the reason i think the creativity plays into this is that part of creativity isn't just what do we do to the garment it is how do we position the garment? What do we do in the way of describing the garment? What do we do in the way of how we position it or display it to our customer? How do we explain the value? How do we teach the value to them? How do we educate the customer? And I think creativity is part of that. If we have something that our competition may not do, or if we have something that the customer has not seen before that is interesting, it doesn't necessarily have to increase the amount that we spend or the amount of labor we put in to get that value back out. So part of the thing I'm saying with creativity in this particular piece is that if you do something with a design that is not common, if you do multimedia, if you do fine detail, if you do something different with the design, if you treat it differently, these things can be perceived as worth more or somehow rarer of course, then something that is standard, that is being done by everybody. Customers pay for the value they perceive. And 
that's only the beginning of it. That is the easy get. The easy get is to say if the customer sees a sweatshirt and it has a really cool design on it that has some sort of, um, app, let's say we have sublimated applique on it, something they've never seen before. It's got a mix of full photo and the texture of embroidery. The thing is, you and I may know that sublimating a piece of glitter flake and putting it on and doing rip away applique where we don't actually have to pre-cut that item is very easy to do, right? It's very simple for us to do. It takes very little time. And it's actually easier than other kinds of applique that don't look as impressive. However, if a customer doesn't know that, all they see is they are interested by the shine, by the full color printing that's embedded in it, and by the difference in textures. That is what they see as, and they perceive that value. Whereas the time we actually spend on this piece may be less than if we did some other sort of multimedia. So we have to think about that. That's the first thing. And I think that's the easy get, just in interesting the, the customer in the direct object, right? But this is the second piece here. Creative execution establishes your reputation. Uh, whenever you hear people talk about social media, they will say, uh, or at least back in the day, they used to say that you're trying to be a, a subject matter expert, right? And being a subject matter expert, SME, all that means is that people perceive you as being the person to go to on a particular subject. Well, creative execution will help with that. If you can create something, once again, that looks different materially than what other people are creating, or if you really do go out there and use a treatment, use a material that people aren't using, you can spin that, teach that, show that, explain that, and it helps you get that reputation both for creativity. People will come to you for that kind of work. I always say show the work you want to do because the work you show is the work people will find, is the work people will request of you. So you do have to be careful with that. Make sure this is stuff that you have a good handle on how to do. But they will see you as a creative person. They will see you as someone who has creative solutions, number one. Number two, they will see you as someone who has a handle on the medium in their milieu, you know, in what we're doing. You will be an embroidery expert if you show excellent embroidery or creative embroidery. And if you show something that isn't like what everybody else does, you come off as the creative person. What I've often said is that some of the best samples I ever put up never sold on their own. You put a creative sample in a window, you show it online, you show it on Instagram, you show video of you creating a thing, and someone who just needs embroidery is looking for embroidery, finds a video of you making some crazy multimedia piece and they go, wow, that's really cool. And if at the end of this video, you also show, we also do, you know, whatever kind of standard embroidery too, this person might come to you and go, wow, that person really knows what they're doing. I love that crazy multimedia thing they did. Yeah, but what I need is, you know, lawn care shirts for all my guys who are out in the field doing, you know, maintenance. Um, that is still a way to bring people in the door. They say, oh, this person's creative. They must know it's up. People understand them. They're here on video. They're sharing their story and they're showing this really cool work. People really like it. We can see somebody resonating with it. It's getting likes. People are checking it out. People are commenting on it. I want someone like that. I want someone who is successful with their medium to do my work, even when it's fairly mundane. So a creative execution also establishes your reputation, right? People pay more for the work of a master in any medium. I think that's that's the case. Now, does that always mean that everyone's gonna do that? No, there's room for the Walmart of the world, right? There is always room for someone who just wants something, they want it today, they want it at a certain price that's gonna happen. But when we're looking for people to almost be our patrons, to um, feed our creative work, we're not looking for that necessarily. Don't get me wrong. These days, right now, I see people taking orders they don't take other, other days. I understand that. When things are difficult, you take the orders. Plus, I also say don't put all your eggs in one basket. I've seen two companies that I've worked for uh, run themselves down terribly, run themselves into the ground over the fact that they put everything into a few large companies and then threw away local business or they changed their model and overly focused in one standard niche that was unable to be flexible in time. I wouldn't say that. What I am saying is, if you want to get that client, if you want to get the client that's going to allow you to do creative work, if you're trying to get a client who pays a premium, being someone who is perceived as an expert, doing work that is above and beyond what other people do is a way to establish that reputation. You And that reputation is what gives them the trust in your work, even when they want something that's fairly mundane, folks. So yeah, creative execution establishes your reputation, right? And here's, here's something I say quite a lot. Uh, creativity makes you a consultant, not a commodity. 
uh, like I said, there's room for the commodity. There's always room for the commodity. Uh, there's room for Walmart. There's room for the big box stores. And especially these days, we have a lot of people who are looking for that. However, we don't just want to be a shirt machine. We don't want money to come in one side and shirts to come out the other side. I mean, can we do that? Contractors do that all the time. And there is need for that. Most of us who are in a different space, who if we are not straight contract embroiderers, contract decorators, we are looking for relationships with people. We are looking for a, and not only that, but we're looking for lifetime value. And part of that is really about being a consultant. Part of your value isn't just the object you produce. It is the creative answer you have to your customer's questions. That's the thing. Think about this in this case. It's like design thinking. Design thinking is where you take this problem someone has and you try and solve the problem. That's what we're trying to apply here. If someone comes to you looking for shirts, that's not their problem. Their problem isn't, I need shirts necessarily. Quite frankly, in, in business to business, what it frequently is, is I want to dress my people in a professional way that gets attention and provides uh, my logo with visibility. So your real problem is logo visibility, not shirts. I mean, do, are you going to use shirts? Maybe, probably. Shirts and hats are a, are a pretty common thing to do. But your real problem is how do I, in the context of how these people will be viewed, these employees will be viewed, show a logo in a way that gets it visibility. And you as a creative worker may have different opinions or different attitudes or different things you can do to make that happen. You're gonna have creative solutions. What is worthwhile is your experience, your desire to understand your process and the creative things you can do both with the application of embroidery and with knowing all of these things about the industry in general, knowing what garments are good to go to, uh, knowing what processes we can lean on, putting together an entire package that is more visible and that works in the right area. Uh, pretty frequently, and I'll go ahead and go full screen for this. You guys may have heard me talk about the handshake distance, right? Previous to all the COVID stuff, the handshake distance is what I always told you to judge things on, right? A handshake three to four feet, that's where you judge a logo. In today's market right now with distancing on everybody's lips, I mean, I know we're going back to normal and things are getting better, but with everyone going back to social distancing first, a logo might need to be judged at six feet to be visible. So what we can imagine now is not that I'm saying you're gonna make every logo bigger, but that if the client is asking you for visibility of a certain item or to read some text, let's say the basic idea of a lot of embroidery, for text to be visible on the employee to the people who are buying things from them, you may actually want that text to be visible from six feet now. That's context and you thinking about that and whatever creative solutions you come up with to make that happen or to make that visibility happen for them, that is what is part of you being a consultant, you thinking about the problem they have and actually trying to solve it. So being a commodity, every one of us can take an image, produce through digitizing or through hiring a digitizer, a file and sew it on a garment. And if you can't do that, that's the basic, that's the cost of entry. Being able to proficiently sew something on a garment that is the cost of entry. We should all be proficient enough to make good embroidery from a file that is a known good file on just about any garment that a customer brings in that is within the normal wheelhouse. Any one of us should be able to do that. What sets you apart, what makes you more than that is your ability to come up with creative solutions, whether that's creative positioning, different logo sizes, different kinds of decoration, different garments, whether it's adding other accessories to the mix, no matter what that problem is, that is where we are consultants. And being a consultant and not a commodity makes us more valuable and creative work, both creative work in the design itself and creative work in the way we put together packages and sales. That makes us consultants, not commodities. I'm gonna jump out and take a couple of comments here real quick and say, uh, Jeff says, uh, man, speaking things I need to hear today, I think we all need to hear this all the time. I need to hear this myself frequently because I come up with uh, solutions for people. I help a lot of people out. And I've had my wife say this before. She's like, you're bagging on yourself for not getting back to people uh, in a, a manner that you want to or not doing more, but you're doing more than other people do. And I'd say anybody here, if you're paying attention to this right now, it's what I say every week. You guys who are paying attention to this, who are here to learn something, or to get your, your creativity jogged, to hear someone speak about the industry. If you are here paying attention, you are ahead, head and shoulders. You are above anybody else who's sitting at home 
uh, saying what was me and lamenting what their situation is right now. If you're out there trying to improve yourself, if you get into the arena with those who are active, you are already ahead of the game. You are already winning. But everybody needs to hear that. Your work is worthwhile. And by the way, here's the thing about being a consultant, not a commodity. If the uh, client knew what to do, they wouldn't need you. If they knew how to embroider something, if they knew how to make this garment happen, if they knew what the design should look like, they wouldn't need you. They do need you. Your expertise is valuable. I'm not saying jump out there and say, hey, man, what do you need? I'm the one who does it for you. I'm the most valuable. No, this is a partnership. But that knowledge of yours is valuable and it means that it's more valuable than just the hours of labor you put into sewing the garment. So we'll jump in and say that. Uh, Frank says, I call it the three foot rule. Yeah, I used to, like I said, handshake distance is what I said now, but with the advent of social distancing, the three foot rule, the handshake distance rule may be six feet. And it may be that when you talk to a customer and you ask them what their problem really is, if their problem is, I want someone to be able to see uh, my employee's name because I want to personalize that employee when they're standing across the counter. Well, at this point, the employee's name might have to be visible from six feet, not three. It's something we have to think about now. I'm not saying that this will be forever, and I'm not necessarily going to make commentary about uh, you know social distancing or any of the rules of the day right now. What I will say, though, is context matters. Context matters, and that's also why creativity matters, because we have to come up to solutions that are in the context that we have now. Uh, another thing I wrote very recently about kind of about creativity, I wrote a piece for the Imbrilliance blog. So if you go to the Imbrilliance project blog, imbrilliance.com, and I'll bring that up again later for other reasons. Um, I wrote a piece about creativity to some degree about uh, people judging your work and us judging our own work and uh, essentially saying, you know, the things that we judge our work on, uh, not people don't always judge our work in the same way. And the other thing I talked about was that uh, your favorite work, like I'll say my favorite work, my favorite work is never the favorite work of someone else who has, has seen my pieces. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and bring this up. I'm going to go to the, the project blog because I believe I can go ahead and bring this in and I think it's worthwhile to do. Let's go ahead and uh, put this thing up a little larger. And first, here's the wall of shame that has uh, tons of samples that uh, my operators put up on the wall. But here's here's just a, an example of what I was talking about. First, uh, your favorite work won't be everybody's favorite. Uh, no matter what work you like to do, other people will like other work better. It's quite possible that they're not going to like the work you like the most. And that's because uh, you are not your audience. And it's something we have to think about. Context is the same thing as consultants. What we have to do is make sure we're answering a problem that the client's actually having, not just the problem we perceive. But to the way of judging yourself and the way of creativity, what I'm going to say is here, I like to show this one. This mag magazine cover piece. I did this for Stitches Magazine back in the day. It was done off a photograph. On the right-hand side is the actual stitch out. Uh, and that's one of my favorite pieces or my favorite piece to show because it was impressive, right? It took a lot of work for me. It took a lot of labor. It was difficult and I sweated over it. And when it came out, it turned out good. But what's one of my wife's favorite pieces of mine? Uh, right here, a botanical piece that is all in one color. Admittedly, there are no trims, no jumps, no nothing in this thing. It runs continuously from one end to the other. So technically still runs quite well. And I'm proud of it uh, in that way. But this is not my favorite piece. This is a simple piece. It's a dogwood flower. It takes no time and it stitches real fast and it's no big deal. And I didn't think of it as a big deal when I was working on it. Whereas this thing up here made me sweat because the actual size of this thing is about, you know, a foot square. Um, this is a really big piece that had a lot of detail in it. The thing is, th there's a couple different things to bring up with this. Number one, we have to think about context. And honestly, uh, for different contexts, this is also true. This context up here for the cover of an embroidery magazine, a big, super complicated piece is probably the right way to go. For uh, what my wife likes for her own pieces, this simple piece is understated and it matches with her design kind of style and it matches with the kind of stuff she would like to wear in her context where it actually embroidery for her is is a personal thing that you put on your own work your own pieces you don't want other people to see it it's for you to look at and enjoy not to show other people that is her attitude toward clothing decoration so very contrary to what we do in the commercial space it is a special little thing you keep for yourself in that context that embroidery down there makes a lot more sense than this big bad boy up here right so we're talking about context as well. And that's the same thing when you're being creative. But what I will say is someone who needs a piece like this down here, like this dogwood flower, seeing that I am capable of this piece up here has no doubt that I can achieve the simpler piece. If they see my work here, they know I can do this simpler piece without asking. So I'll say that there still is something to producing pieces like this, but it is worthwhile to say that. Uh, you know, the audience is important, the context is important, and you can't uh, separate those out. 
right? You can't take those away. But let's jump back over, since I'm already here in the browser, let's jump back over to what we had here. And you can see we talked about the fact that uh, creativity makes you a consultant, not a commodity. I discussed why that's important. Go ahead and go to the second page here. This is a big one. Novelty kills comparisons to the ordinary. When you have something novel and interesting that isn't like what other people have done, if you do produce work that is in and of itself novel, that pushes a button for something where they're like, that is interesting. I've never seen that before. I don't know what that is. I would like to find out what that is. Novelty or novel work, work that's done differently, that has a different finish to it, is going to kill comparisons to the ordinary because there are no apples to apples comparisons if your work doesn't look like the work that other people do. So if you do creative work, I, I've said this several times, if you do a piece where we have a silhouette and one person does it as a flat fill from top to bottom, one angle, and the other person carves out individual pieces and has facets and has light and shadow there. I'm not saying that one is necessarily better than the other. For me, I like the faceted piece that's carved quite a lot better. I think it has more visual interest to it. And frankly, if done correctly with satin stitches, you sometimes even have a lower stitch count than the fill piece. However, I have had a couple customers who like the flat piece better, truthfully. That is when you have an audience issue. I didn't really listen to them as an audience and found out that I did a lot of work I didn't need to. They wanted simple, they wanted flat. Had to talk to them about that. However, when I try and compare my work to others, and if everyone else is doing flat fill work, is doing something very simple, and I'm doing something that doesn't look like that, it has surface and texture, they don't even look like the same thing. I've had people ask me what was different about them or say, yours just looks different. And they don't feel like it's the same thing. It's very hard for them to say, well, I'm paying this for this guy here and I'm paying this for this guy here. And to say, the other person is cheaper than you on this item. Well, if your item doesn't look like theirs, if it has a direct point of comparison that differentiates it, if you can differentiate it on site, it's easier for you to kill that comparison to the ordinary work and to justify price differences. And that's where it's bottom line again. Uh, frequently, I've had somebody look at the different kinds of work I've done and say, okay, yeah, Eric's work because I I did. I pride, pride myself on putting more detail into things, doing smooth blends, things like that, and to adding small, meaningful details or redesigning things to work in context instead of just reproducing the art as it came in. Uh, especially back in the day. These days, I'm seeing a lot more creative people out there who are really trying and making something interesting with their embroidery using the medium. But when I first started, a lot of the work I would get back was really just done in the same formula where whatever art you sent out, someone would send back with the least amount of effort put into it uh, at the largest size they thought they could get away with so they didn't have to deal with fine detail or any sort of interactions with, you know, small satin stitches or small gaps, small texts especially. And because I would stretch what was possible with the medium at the time, I often would have the two pieces next to each other and someone would just say, well, that one just looks better and it would kill the comparison. And especially when we did something like bringing in multimedia, doing sublimation very early on where we would sublimate embroidery or do sublimation in, com in composition with embroidery or any sort of multimedia or applique. When that wasn't being done, by my competitors, it was really easy for me to kill the comparison and immediately say, well, yeah, that's not what I've done. And I think that's really true. When you jump in and say, okay, here's the piece that I can do for you versus what somebody else can do for you. If they aren't approaching your look or they just aren't even achieving a look that is similar to yours, it kills that comparison. Immediately, it's apples to oranges, not apples to apples. Because if we all just kick out very similar designs, if everybody had the same file involved, if everybody was using the same garment, same placement, and didn't have, or same experience, by the way. Same experience, I can go into it too. If someone has not interviewed your customer, but you do, you show that you care and you actually try and address their problems rather than just saying, what do you want? What kind of shirt? You already have set yourself apart before you even do that kind of work. And like I said, I think creative solutions are creative work. It's not just about how you render an embroidered design. It's about the solution you come up with. If you help them to have a solution either to, so let's say, their, their ordering process, their distribution, stuff like that, or you come up with a, a look or a design that makes sense for them, and you are different, you are markedly different, you immediately quash comparisons. And I'm not saying they will never do it. You will have a guy uh, who will come into you. You'll have a customer who just says, hey, I want a logo on a shirt. It's got to have the name for my company, and that's it. 
If somebody says that and that's all they want, the likelihood of you using creativity to, to market to them is not high. However, that's a context cue. By interviewing the customer, you should know that. What you might be able to do is convince them on garments that make more sense for their usage. If there's somebody who has high turnover or garments that are uh, constantly being destroyed and you can pitch them a higher quality garment that is less likely to get destroyed, that's a creative solution too. If you are pitching them something that looks different, that it works better for their context, that's a creative solution too. Like I said, be a consultant, not a commodity. But in any way, shape or form, when you have something novel, whether it's the experience you have, whether it's the solution you come up with, even if it's a package deal, even if it's, let's say we're dealing with a, a team or a school, especially when we start coming back from how these things are. Or right now, let's say that a school is used to ordering batch garments and let, we have a lot of these teams and clubs and things that have this discretionary uh, cash that is going to evaporate if they don't spend it in this budgetary area, even with everything closed. If they're used to buying big batches and boxes of garments and having to do their own distribution, but you right now stop and say, hey, I understand things are tough right now. I will individually package and sell, send these off to your students. That's already a creative solution. And if you then say, hey, why don't we throw in this other item that is easy, cheap, non-sized, but add something to the quality. Maybe you do a design piece for them that is original or interesting or topical. You are going to give them a creative solution that will set you apart. And the people who don't do that, who just continue doing business as usual, you will quash comparison to them. Anyway, so let's go ahead and go to a couple of comments here real quick. Ramona says, uh, I have a sample wall now. I put my favorites up there. Yeah, I am I am torn on the sample wall. I like to look at the, the sample wall sometimes. The problem I have is that my operators put it up there sloppily, and I will say uh, I don't always like all the things that are up there. I'm going to call uh, shenanigans on Matt here. Simple wife, simple life, not at all. My wife likes simple pieces, but she's also very particular, and she's very smart. She's smarter than I am. So yeah, uh, my wife is not a simple person at all, though she does like uh, simple work and makes me uh, – simplify my own over detailed stuff quite a bit. Uh, how big is the carousel design? Carousel design really is, it is like a foot square. I mean, it is a large tab, almost a tabloid size. I think like 11 by 17, not quite. It's 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 smaller than that, but it is very large. So uh, it's a pretty big, big piece. I mean, not like giant quilt square pieces, but pretty big stuff anyway. And then let's go to Christine has uh, something definitely to add here. Uh, offering a solution that sol solves a problem for a customer is so valuable. They're coming to you for expertise and help. The more of both of those things you can supply, the higher your possibility of making the sale. Also, the higher possibility of customer retention. Remember, retention is a lot easier than selling new customers and expansion with existing customers who already trust you is easier. And if you think about what we've already talked about today, being creative, throwing out pieces that are novel, showing a mastery of your medium increases trust on the lead end. So when you do acquire a new customer, they already trust your abilities and in trusting your abilities, they have an increased willingness to buy from you and you're closer to the tipping point when you need to buy. So yeah, uh, <laughs> I, and yeah, I agree with this. Lisa says, I'd like to see pictures of sample walls. Yes. If people send in pictures of sample walls, next Friday, I will put up sample wall pictures. I will do that. If we can, it may not be next Friday, but I will put up sample wall pictures if I get enough of them. So everybody get together your sample wall pictures and, and comment with them here on the post or uh, email me or whatever. Let's try and get some sample wall pictures because that's awesome. Or if you guys just want to show samples in the comments, show cool samples. Why not? Uh, and I know somebody will say to me always like, Aren't you worried somebody's going to bite your style when your samples? I don't. I don't care. If if someone takes the style and works with it and makes something new, that's awesome. Do I want you to do a knockoff of one of my pieces? Not especially. Nobody wants that. Do I want you to take the style that I've made, retool it, learn from it, maybe buy some design that I've done, tear it all apart, and learn the sequence out of it, and learn the settings that I used, and then reapply it? Absolutely. It's how I learned everything, and I want you to do the same thing. But. Let's go to the last point in the article. Then I'm going to jump into a couple of uh, little pieces we can do in the way of explanation for a while. Um, and we'll just finish out like that, right? We'll go into some actual pieces and, and I will tell some stories as well like, to a degree. I don't know if we'll call it telling stories so much as just explaining some samples, but why not? Uh, the last thing I want to mention here is the balance. Admittedly, everybody always says to me, you know, can you really make this profitable? And yes, you can, but there is a balance to be struck. Um, we all know that we can get into craft project land. You can start doing creative work that is not viable. There was actually a time where I was working with uh, people at Black Duck, the last company I worked with. Um, we essentially had some projects that we really loved. We wanted to put up and show everybody. We did a lot of stuff for the movies. That was one thing we couldn't show everybody, movies and TV. But the other stuff we did, 
we had a, a ton of really difficult stuff because people would come in needing a solution for something and we would often take on craft projects, these projects that were technically very difficult, but that we wanted to learn how to do partially to expand our ability and partially because we got excited about them, but they weren't always the most profitable. One of the pieces was we had a, uh, a bride who wanted the interior liner of her dress to match her, uh, it was a China pattern that had run through her family. And so we took this, you know, ancient China pattern and then the, there was this old piece of China and we copied that and painted this pattern. Then we made sublimated panels. We laid them all out and we made yardage of this sublimated material to go on the inside of her dress. Here's the thing. I wanted to show this in our social media and we finally stopped ourselves. We said, okay, Yes, we showed. We decided to show some of it, but we had to explain very clearly that this was a passion project and then put a price to it in our minds before we ever showed it. Why? Because at the price we actually quoted on this thing, it was not at all worth the amount of labor we put into it. There is a balance to achieve where you can understand, hey, I am doing something for that reason. And it's okay sometimes to take those on, especially when you're expanding yourself or if it's going to help you learn something that helped us learn something. It helped us learn how to do these multi-press uh, borders. And it was something we did use, but not frequently. It turned out also to be a teaching experience that we learned it wasn't going to be as profitable for us as we thought to do something of this custom nature. But we did get to help a client, someone who also then brought us other kinds of work. And we got to do a project that that helped us learn more about sublimation as we were just starting. So really, there are <laughs> there are ways to do craft projects that make sense, even when they aren't super profitable. But we do have to understand the balance. And that is the balance we look for. You have to know when your investment makes sense. If you can multi-purpose something, let's say I want to make a really detailed design. I know that I'm not going to get paid for every ounce of my time for embroidery, but I can tell, tell the person I want to use this for a sample. I want to show this piece and it's going to help me with what I'm doing. I'm willing to take it on, but next time you do a piece that's this detailed, I'm just going to let you know it costs this much. Uh, one of the tips I always say to people, if you want to give something away or discount something, don't just discount it or tell someone the price. Tell them the full price. Put the full price on the invoice, strike that out, give them the price that you're willing to give them now and make it clear that there is a full price and higher value to your pieces that is not represented in the actual cost that you are coming back to. So be honest about that with the customer. Be honest about what things are going to be, but you can take some of these things on. The deal is to understand your balance. Also, lifetime value of a customer. There are pieces I've done at a loss for a single job for a customer that I've had for years that I know I will have for years or when I'm going out to grab a customer who is going to be lucrative for me. I have done spec work. Everybody cusses on spec work. I'll say the truth of the matter is this. Yes, we don't like uh, big companies to do spec design contests and pick one of, uh, you know, of a thousand entries and pay that one person for their work. That's where we don't like spec work. When you yourself want to go out and solicit business from someone, when you choose to do spec work because you either have the time, like right now, a lot of people have time to bleed off, to use, or because you really do want to coach you know, that client into working with you, that's okay to do. Also, I have done more detailed work for clients who had like lifetime value, who had long-term value. So that's just what I want to say. It's, it's a balance that you have to strike to do creative work and to understand when it's worthwhile. And actually with that, I can actually go into some samples here. Uh, first, let me go ahead and grab a couple of comments and we'll jump from there into samples and finish out. So let's jump in with uh, Matt. Uh, that's a good point. I'll have to remember which point I made at the time. Uh, I had a guy email me about getting a patch made a year ago. He wanted them based off of a design. I found that patch finished online for way cheaper than I could do. I sent him the link and he said, thanks. Uh, just this week, he came back and asked for some custom donut patches, sale confirmed. Absolutely. There is nothing wrong with that. Also, there's nothing wrong with telling a, a person, you know, if they have someone else they can go to to get something done, that it's okay to do that. And sometimes you're getting them out of your hair if they're not going to be useful to you. Doing create super creative, difficult work, uh, just to keep the work in in house is not the best idea. The best idea is definitely to be upfront with people and let them know. Plus, this person trusts you. You have built up trust. And though you we were talking about creativity, trust is on the back end of all this creativity discussion as well. And Christine chimes in with that as well. Uh, you can never go wrong with being honest with a customer. Customers remember that, especially when you admit there's a cheaper option that would work as well or help them find uh, someone who can do something you can't do. Showing you are concerned about serving the customer and not just making a buck is always a good idea. Awesome that your custom customer came back and ordered. Uh, what I will say on this too, Christine is totally right. What I will say is don't forget to make the ask. 
It is totally okay when you consult for someone essentially, and you tell them, hey, you know what? That's not something that I can do for you, but here are the people you can go to. Here is where you should go for that. This is the solution that makes the most sense for you. At the end of that, say, if there's something that I can do for you, or the next time you have an order, I would love to be the person you turn to to help you find your solution. It's okay to jump in. And in fact, it is necessary to put the ask into that. You have given value, go ahead and ask for some value back. That's all right. I mean, give value first, lead with empathy, care about those people and care about their solution. But when you offer value, totally okay to ask for value back, especially when it's like, I would love a referral. If you have somebody else who could use my services, I would love for you to send them to me. And if that next job comes in and you're curious whether or not something I can do for you, please come to me. I would love to help you out. There's nothing wrong with saying that. In fact, you should say that. And honestly, we have done that several times. Many of the shops I've been in, especially at times where people had individual pieces that either needed a kind of work that I couldn't do, or let's just say we were in holiday mode where people are doing individual pieces and we were doing larger runs. We used to keep a stable of small at home or cottage embroiderers running on small orders. And we did not expect, we could have done the thing people do often, do the thing where you get some sort of a, you know fee or referral fee. We didn't expect that. What we did do is send people to them directly openly and say, you know, this one piece order right now, we can't get it done. I can provide you with somebody who can do it. If you ever have another order that's over this number of pieces that makes more sense for us, that is this kind of order. Or let's say I have to send this to someone who has a uh, sewing shop on hand that can do your alterations for this garment. I'm going to send you to this person to get your alterations done. If you just have decoration to do that doesn't require alterations, please come on back to us and we'll handle it. And that's fine. Do you always get them back? No, they might not be your ideal client, but you're more likely by far every time to get that relationship coming back if you can do that. So let's go ahead and go back to Ramona. She says, I keep a list of clients to provide other services. And when they ask for a name, I have my list. Absolutely. And also you'll find that those people will also refer to you when they don't have whatever creative service you offer. Plus, by the way, creativity, the other thing you can do, if you offer a service or a treatment or a design style that you are particularly good at, that you show everybody you can do, those people you partner up with who you send other kinds of work will then refer to you as the expert in that subject and you'll be getting work from them. It increases your funnel. So think about that with creativity as well. And Christine Br jumps back in and says, definitely have to make the ask. Uh, serving the customer is important, but it has to be reciprocal. Uh, don't get trapped in always being helpful, never getting anything back from the help you give. Serving the customer is important, but it has to be a balance. You know, lead with the service, but there's nothing wrong with making the ask. Everybody's offering value. Everybody is getting something out of it. Let's go ahead and jump over from here. I'm going to jump into a couple other things here uh, as far as examples, right? We want to talk about examples of work that is creative, but offers a solution. And we're actually going to jump over to software for this. First, we're going to jump into Stitch Artists. You can see this is actually a design I did quite some time ago. And this was done, as you can see here, for the Albuquerque International Balloon Fiesta, right? This is a creative design that was both, in my opinion at least, artistically creative, but it was also creative for another reason. You see, uh, Albuquerque International Balloon Fiesta is a massive balloon festival that happens out here in uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico. If you haven't seen it, I mean, literally tens of thousands of hot air balloons in the sky, uh, colors, it looks like a massive psychedelic you know, experience, and it is, it's crazy. Um, however, one of the things they've been known for is balloon fiesta jackets. The balloon fiesta jackets generally have a really large decoration in the back of them. Um, and this decoration is uh, tends to be quite extravagant. And the jackets they used for many years were Columbia jackets. If you know anything about those, they're quite expensive jackets, especially they were at the time. Um, and these jackets were very well known. Problem being, there was a year which um, they ended up where their sponsorship dropped out at the time. And they didn't have a sponsor to handle things and they were strapped. They had to have jackets. They had to have big full coverage designs. And these designs had to be done locally, whereas they were always hired out overseas. So suddenly we now have a problem. The problem being we want to keep the standard up of the kind of jackets we've done for years. They have to be attractive. They have to be cool. Uh, they need to look like a balloon fiesta jacket. They have to be a, a large, colorful design featuring balloons on the back. This have to now be done in, in the States. They have to be done quickly because this deal has fallen through at a very inopportune time. And they have to have um, all of this done as cheaply as possible. Really, we have to save money because this is something we're now taking on that used to be sponsored. Uh, my opinion was that we could make this thing happen by 
watching stitch counts and doing creative solutions rather than just slamming more stitches at it because all of the jackets previous to this that in my memory were large full coverage embroideries because when you are overseas and you don't have to pay as much for stitch count you don't have to then consider that stitch count and so they would just throw mass graphics at it and dump stitch count on it dump stitches at it cover the entire thing up so this was my answer to that problem right this is my answer to that uh let's use contour stitching contour stitching was not something that was commonly being used in an open work fashion at the time especially not in, in commercial work this is quite some time ago that i did this piece and if i turn on the 3d view you can kind of see what we're looking at here right let's use open work so we have open work swirls here and then we have contour stitching meaning that we're going along what's essentially a columnar satin stitch type path but what we're doing is we're allowing that spacing, same number of rows of stitching or columns of stitching here as we have down here at the bottom of each of these uh, whales in the balloon fabric. The thing is that means what we're going to have is more density toward the bottom and top and a more open density in the center. What does that give us? It gives us the illusion of shading for free. We allow some of the color of the background to come through and we do that on purpose. It's darker here and brighter here. Why is that? Well, because we have that spacing. Now we're also lucky because this is a hot air balloon. If you've ever seen hot air balloons go up, they glow. When they fire up the propane burners inside, there is a glow and often what you have is a big bright spot here because especially they fly in the mornings. Uh, what you're going to see in the dim light is a glowing bottom. They're going to actually flare up and they actually do things called balloon glows where they have them anchored on the field and they glow when they fire these things up at night. And so what did I do? I decided, okay, I can use this contour. I can use swirls. They were in the original art. There were some swirl elements. All right, I'm going to use that swirl element from the art from the advertising. And then I did one other thing. I went ahead and added a contour flame, very much like a hot red flame. And this was done in metallic thread, right? The thing about that is through the other fills that were here, it was on top of the background fill, but underneath this top fill that shows the collar of the balloon and through the rest of the balloon itself, there were little visible sparkles of the flame. But here's the thing that really makes the most sense out of this piece. What do we have? We have almost 10 by nine inches in coverage and we're only using about 33,000 stitches. So that's the thing, 33,000 stitches, incredibly light for what it was. And we've solved the problem, right? We solved the problem. The problem being that we have to do this cheaply. We have to have it fast because we have no time and we have to do it locally. It needs to be creative. It needs to look like a balloon fiesta design. So it's gotta have a lot of color and it's gotta have big balloons. All of those things were solved all at once. And actually this is a piece that won an award for me because I then took this off of the production line and I sent this in for awards. It was one of the pieces I won on. And I'm gonna go ahead and jump back over and we'll see this. I can show you this piece actually in a sample. You can see here, this is a sample on denim, which is not the best look for it, but you can see how that element kind of glows. And I'll go ahead and bring that back up. You'll see how we have this, this look to it as if it glows as it gets further down the sample. And you'll see that there's these little sparkles. Now it's not gonna be nearly as good here as it was in the actual piece, but throughout that light fill on top, you do have the sparkles of that gold flame. So that was something that was valuable to them, right? Very valuable to them to actually solve the problem but it was also valuable enough, it came back later in another format. Later on, we went ahead when they switched to a new style of balloon in their advertising for one of the years, they called this, this balloon that was actually, they were putting these up, these candy, candy stripe type balloons. We actually went back and modified another version of that very similar balloon style for their safety, uh, the safety people who are doing their work as well. So you can see these swirls here. Uh, once again, simple contour stitching. And what am I going to tell you? Uh, anybody who knows this, these are not that hard to digitize. The contour does the work itself by its very nature. It just looks like this because of what it is. Because we have in the wider sections, the same number of rows in the thinner sections, the differences in shading come from the median. They come from the way contour stitching works in this column. Now think about that for a second. It means that I did not do particularly a lot of extra detailed work to make this happen. It was my knowledge of my tools and my knowledge of the medium that made this happen. So later on, we ended up retooling it and using it for the public safety balloons as well. Uh, and these were put on the jackets uh, another year later um, in order to 
use this other balloon style, but same thing happened there, same style. And it's actually a style that I've used many times because those contour stitches do just have this excellent look to them that it's uh, hard to explain. But yeah, like I said, um, samples look, look interesting. I th and one of the other pieces I'd like to bring up, it's a very similar kind of problem. It's a piece a lot of people like, right? Uh, this is a Trapunto design, the USA flag Trapunto design, and it is done in straight stitches. And this was done in my worst software, guys. This is done in the software that didn't have curves in it. QDT doesn't exist anymore. It's DOS-based software. It doesn't show colors, doesn't draw curves. So you're going to see that there's some flat lines in here. It's because I was not trying to draw any more teeny tiny pieces that you need to. So um, that's the way that, that works. So you end up where you have these big flat pieces. Why? Because I couldn't draw a curve in my software. And this is actually a very early piece for me, right? Very open, uh, open, light piece. But here's the thing. When you look at it, it's got a little bit of trapunto. If you use it either on a very, really thick fleece, or in this particular piece, I think I have a very small piece, of, a very thin piece of quilt batting inside between the stabilizer and the front, or if you use it on a really thick sweatshirt, this design, the open work allows those letters to pop forward, right? So it has visual interest, it has dimension, but it doesn't use stitches to get that dimension. That's not 3D foam, that's not extra material necessarily, especially on a thick sweatshirt, it didn't need that because all I was doing is tamping down the thickness, the loft of that sweatshirt with the stitching. Um, you can actually get a lot of that with very few stitches. So if you look at this piece, I'm actually gonna bring up the original file in software, which is a, uh, a shocker for me because this is not like it's going to look great folks this file is rough it is not something all that spectacular as you can see big horrible angles on this s it makes me cringe just to show it to you however what i'm going to show you that's interesting about it right this piece was done in order to sincerely sell off dead stock we had a bunch of these sport gray sweatshirts and at a time where there was a lot of patriotic americana kind of designs going around we decided we were going to sell those into the stores. The shop that I worked on wanted to sell boxes and boxes of these sweatshirts. What we wanted to do is run them cheaply, have as much visual impact, as much coverage as we could for the front of a sweatshirt with the least amount of stitches. So what are we looking at here? We are looking at nearly nine inches by six inches. So a pretty decent size, not huge, pretty decent size. And this is only 8,800 stitches. So less than 9,000 stitches and we're getting this kind of visual interest, we're getting this kind of dimension. And so this is what we have for that, that little tiny amount of stitches, less than 9,000, we're almost covering like a nine by seven swatch on this garment. So we have a full sweatshirt front, retail styled, uh, all of that dimension for less than 9,000 stitches. So what do we know, especially on machines these days, it can run a thousand stitches a minute, uh, without breaking a sweat, we, you know, we've got nine minutes. We've got, let's say we have 15 minutes in it tops. And uh, that's really pretty short for a large run, especially a multi-head run. So we're, we're running this thing, you know, <laughs> hell bent for leather. It can run fast and it runs quite well. So that is something that I think is useful. Once again, I had a problem to solve, right? I had a problem to solve. Problem is I need to get as much coverage as I can for the fewest amount of stitches. And I need to make these sweatshirts valuable to the client to run off. And that's how I solved that problem was by a, a more interesting look. It's not fully covered. It doesn't look like anybody else's designs did at the time. It was rough. It was not the usual look whatsoever. It was handmade looking almost. It had jagged edges, but it had visual interest. It was three-dimensional and it had novelty. It's not something else you would see because that Trapunto style wasn't common in the market, though it did tie into a time when embossed styles, actually using the heat presses that emboss garments were kind of coming into favor. So here is my ability to take my knowledge of my materials and my knowledge of my tools and make something that mocked a popular look, but was slightly different and had extra color in it. And even when you saw embroidered Trapunto at the time, it was often a single color affair. And instead I used three colors to make that happen. Not a huge amount of creativity you ask me. It's not that crazy. And in fact, the funny thing is I've shown this sample so many times, everybody says, aren't you afraid of people stealing? None of you have done it yet. Uh, somebody has, I've not had somebody come back to me with their version of this thing yet, but I'm sure you could. It wouldn't be that hard, folks. Um, leave those nice big open spaces and get some, and if you have to, put a little thin quilt bag behind it, make something 3D and crazy. It's awesome. Um, but yeah, this was valuable, but it wasn't extra input aside from the creativity. And that creativity made those shirts fly, made us able to sell those things off. We ran them off and sold them uh, retail. 
So there's retail pricing on something that was dead stock. Uh, we're solving a problem and it's the creativity that matters, not necessarily the input. So let's go ahead and go to a last couple uh, remarks and we'll finish off once again, a little bit of bonus time. I'll have to do some cutting and cropping if I wanna put this on Instagram, folks. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm happy to stay with you guys for just a little bit longer. Let's jump out and uh, I want to show you a slide that's actually from my demis demystifying next level digitizing um, session that I did. And it's also a slide that I've shown in other sessions because I like everybody to think about this. Um, people are often afraid of failure. They don't like to do things that don't turn out well, but creativity really requires you to be experimental and to fail at times. And trust me, I've ruined more garments than probably most of you have seen. Uh, and I don't know, you guys may have a lot of experience, but I like to tell you guys that so you can feel a little less poor. Uh, what I, the joke that always goes around is that I am the patron saint of failed embroidery causes. I will talk to you guys about everything. I will uh, try and save any destroyed garment I can. But here's the thing, you have to accept all results because failure, despite not always being the best option, it can be sometimes because it's educational. If you look on the left-hand side of this image, that is a reverse applique piece that I did by hand. Why did I do this piece? Well, originally, because I was working with an incredibly expensive shirt that someone had brought in, and the shirt ended up getting a hole in it. Unfortunately for them, uh, you know, it couldn't be saved very easily, but it was something that I wanted to play with, and I wanted to use the blank. Uh, blank really couldn't be used for anything else. We were told to keep the blank, and so I decided, hey, I'm going to salvage this blank by making a design. So I taught myself a little bit about reverse applique. Now, this one is a hand-cut ragged reverse applique, that Raven design, and I created it just for the heck of it. That thing is just cut out. Uh, what you have there is a reverse applique there. This is two different pieces of um, fairly heavy jersey knit and I've stitched the one underneath the other and cut the top layer off. That's reverse applique. If I had a laser or if I had a hot cut station on a like ZSK has a, a heat cutter that could do this kind of stuff. A lot easier than how I did. I did this by hand because it was a, a test and a sample. However, that's one of the things I did. It goes into what this finally happens here. So on the right, the middle there, on the right hand side of the two pieces on the on the left there, you'll have this Viking head, right? The Viking age looking head that is done in what is a mock of a chain stitch or a split stitch. And I'll go ahead and try and bring it up so you see that a little bit bigger. But this, that centerpiece has a mock chain stitch, a mock split stitch. And I created that because I was trying to come up with kind of a hand look to things. I wanted to have a chain stitch like look that I could show people for, uh, truthfully at first it was for names because they were trying to show me um, old hand chain stitched name badges and plates that they wanted to be reproduced. So I was coming up with that. And this is just a design I did for fun. In fact, the rendering here is done by Carolyn Cagle and she did this on mittens, fleece mittens that looked really cool. And she loves all things Viking. So me doing this Viking styled embroidery, she loved. But that hand stitched look, that was something I just came up with and played with. It wasn't exactly failure, but it was just play. It was just me trying stuff out. And honestly, it didn't get used a lot for its original usage because people didn't like it as much as I thought they would. They liked it for a lot of other reasons. It ended up being used for other work, but it wasn't used for the actual original reason for the names, uh, the name plates, because they actually ended up going with standard embroidery, the people who asked for this first. But on the right hand side, what you're going to see, showing these two samples, showing these creative works that I did, those pieces on the left, those were shown. These were things that were in my catalog and up on the wall. When we had a school come in, they were looking for something interesting. They were like, man, we just want something textural, something different, something that looks a little bit uh, distressed, that looks vintage. And we want something that's just different. They looked at these pieces and thought, wow, that's awesome. We like that. But oh, check this out. We like that split stitch. It looks like an old school chain stitch machine. I'm like, yeah, it does. It looks, oh, it looks like, uh, you know, Disneyland the hats have the names on them. I'm like, yeah, chain stitch. Yeah, that's what it is. And they decided, okay, well, we want to have something like that for ourselves, but we want to print. So we want to do a print and one of these appliques. On the right-hand side there is what ends up happening. We had that same chain stitch applied to a rough hand cut jersey knit applique that went on a jersey polo. So here is a way for us to use this to make a light applique. It's light. It doesn't have to be precise. We don't have to worry too much about positioning because we just threw the jersey on top and we cut it by hand. The fact that it is supposed to be distressed meant that the hand cut was acceptable and we didn't have to take a lot of care, care to do it. And what we essentially have here is a flock screen print on top of which we've done a rough cut applique, which didn't matter too much for the placement. So though the hand cutting costs money, 
they were willing to pay for the hand cutting. And it was something we could actually leave to people who didn't have a lot of experience because truth of the matter was if they were flubbing a little bit, that was fine because the rough cut applique was the desired look. So here is a failure, a little bit of play. And these things were shown as creative options and it became something that was ordered for an entirely huge run of uh, school store and booster club items. So what happened there? Creativity and play made the difference. So like I said, creativity sets you apart. It is a way for you to be a consultant, not a commodity. It quashes comparisons to people who are doing the same old work. So creativity can affect your bottom line. Does it mean that you are always going to be able to be super creative and do a lot of extra labor? No, absolutely not. The thing is, it doesn't always mean extra labor. And creativity goes beyond just the way you treat a design. Creativity is about how you solve problems for people and the experience they have with you. So I would just like to encourage you all to apply that creativity wherever you can. So apply creativity and realize the ways that it actually does affect the bottom line, improve your bottom line, and helps you to secure and retain clients. With that, I'm going to go ahead and show you guys a couple other things that are going on right now in the world of embroidery for me, and then we will finish out and end this bonus time. Uh, as you can see, we're having some slowdown, so I'm going to just jump entirely over to the other screen. First thing I want to say is, guys, uh, still going on, has been going on, and is getting probably going to start thinning out a little bit. The Stay Strong and Stitch On project with Imbrilliance, a lovely thing that uh, Brian enabled uh, Lisa, Sean, myself to do, still going on. And I want to show you the last piece I put up because a lot of you guys I know have been using these pieces for your own orders for uh, first responders, stuff like that. And the last piece I put up is actually very well suited to that. We have a classic firefighters, multis, cross the cross axes. If you want to go over to imbrilliance.com, over to the projects blog, you can get this file for yourself in a uh, resizable format if you get the Imbrilliance Express module that we have out there for free for you. Uh, but jump out there, grab that design and use it for yourself. You can sell it to your fire department people. That is fine by us. So this is not something you cannot use commercially. You absolutely can. Kick out a stitch file and run it if you want to. But once again, Stay Strong Stitch On has been an awesome campaign. I think we, like I said, we are going to be dialing it down a little bit. Uh, we were daily to the point of having about 30 of these things, but we are backing down and letting ourselves have a little bit of breathing room. But we really appreciate everybody who's jumped in on the Imbrilliance blog and who has been sharing this stuff and who jumped in. I mean, like Jeff, who is in listening now, did a piece that we also offered. It was awesome. So everybody who jumped in, super fantastic. I would love to uh, talk to you guys about that. So anytime you want to check in on that, check out the Imbrilliance Project blog. You can contact me too and I can point you to stuff. But if you get down here to Imbrilliance.com and you look down on the left-hand side to projects, you will find all of those pieces. And if you click on the tag for Stay Strong Stitch On, there are tons and tons. In fact, one of the other things we had one of our users contribute, and this was awesome. We talk about creative solutions. Uh, people who are trying to deal with seniors who aren't going to be able to have senior events, well, she gave them uh, freestanding lace bookmarks and these really cool keychains, snap tap keychains. And I know that's really something that crafters do usually, but I've also seen a lot of embroiderers now who are uh, trapped up, who are looking for garments or things to sew. You can also make your own FSL, freestanding lace type stuff, or do pieces like these uh, vinyl cuts. So you have a non-sized item that you can offer. And this was something that just made those kids feel a little bit better. And it was something that also the parents and grandparents could offer to those kids to give them some recognition, right? Because what are they actually looking for? What's the problem they're having? The problem is not, I need a bookmark or I need a shirt. The problem is I am having a time that is important to me in my life and it is not being recognized. Well, let's make sure that we give them gifts and recognize them. So that's another thing you can go actually and download yourself as well and customize to your heart's content. So jump over there to the Imbrilliance blog and check out that stuff. Um, I do have a little bit of news, which is not the best news ever. And so I'll deliver this personally. Unfortunately, if you were planning on going to the Decorated Apparel Expo show in Minnesota, which would be about three weeks away, even on the reschedule, it's looking more and more like that's just not going to happen. So if you were planning the Decorated Burial Expo show in Minnesota, I would not uh, plan for that right now. I don't know that that's something that we're going to have the clear answer on soon, but we should shortly. Uh, not going to happen. However, what you can do, if you are trying to get to my uh, last seminar, I am actually the last class. I'm closing out all the online sessions. Uh, the final seminar, which was uh, debating digitizing, and it talks about whether or not you want to bring digitizing in-house, what digitizing really is. Uh, what to expect from digitizing, what it can do for you, and a little bit about how to digitize safely and set up your stations. Um, 
that stuff is still happening tomorrow. The online version of it is happening. So if you go to the seminar track, you go to uh, DAXshow.com, you check out the Minnesota seminar track and you sign up for it, you can still attend it online tomorrow. Tomorrow at uh, 10 a.m. Mountain Time. Uh, I'm not great with time zones all the time, so I will let you figure that out on your own. But yeah, uh, that is still going on if you want to see that. But the chances of getting out to Minnesota to see the DAX show are uh, pretty slim right now. So I wouldn't expect to see you guys out in Treasure Island anytime soon, unfortunately. But at least the online stuff is still going on. And uh, last thing I'll, I'll throw in there is because online education is such a big thing right now, everybody's getting their chance to be on. Uh, as I told you guys last week and have been telling you, the Domestifying Next Level Digitizing course that I taught online, uh, people over at Decorators Community went ahead and decided to offer that up as an online recording. It doesn't have all the same contact you got to have or the Q&A or the call with me that you can schedule. That stuff is not included, but if you just want the bare recording, you can get it. And it is at the uh, same location that the show, the sign up was for the original setup, which is uh, bit.ly slash Eric D-D, E-R-I-C-H-D-D, that is all caps. And you can purchase access to that uh, recording. So like I said, not something that I'm uh, making much money on, but it's something that the decorators community gets supported by. And it does certainly, uh, help them know what you want. And it helps uh, you get a chance to be in one of my long, like three hour classes without having to sign up for a full seminar. So last things I wanna have you guys look at, once again, go back, check out Embrilliance.com. Embrilliance is also who allows me to be in the studio here and do the work that I do with you during hours that uh, could be well used in making more assets for the Embrilliance and Stitch Artist communities, but are spent here. Um, and so go to Embrilliance.com, check out what they have going on. And like I said, Stay Strong Stitch On has been awesome. It's been great. And I'm happy that those designs are seeing use, but I would like to have more of you guys go out there and check them out if you can. Um, with that though, I think we're going to go ahead and finish for this week. I have enjoyed having you all on. It's always great to see everybody. And like I said, we have everybody here checking in on comments. The live interaction is really what I love. And what I'm going to go ahead and do is go for the last round of comments before we shut down. And let's see what we got here. Cindy says, would you mind if I tried to digitize something like the USA? Not at all. Please digitize it, show it, tag me. I'll share it very likely because I want to talk about it. If you have questions, let's talk about that in the comments, people. Absolutely. Um, Lisa says, uh, Matthew does contours and Ember. I don't know how to use them yet. Yeah. Uh, no matter what software you have that has contour stitching, I mean, in Brilliant Stitch Artist has it and we've used it there too. I love it. Uh, contour stitching or whatever variety they call that stuff, it is very useful. It is interesting. And it has a lot of effects that people like. So definitely try that stuff out. Lisa, is that sublimated? No, the devil is not sublimated. It was flock screen printing multimedia. So I had it screen printed and then ran on top of it. Thing is, positioning wasn't that important because of the vintage nature of it and it was supposed to look rough. So that was part of the thing. Limiting, that's part of the balance. Limiting how much work you're going to do by the way you design the piece ahead of time. Limit the amount of work you have to do. Jeff, still have to set up my call. Yes, you do. <laughs> still have to set your call. Uh, me scheduling those is going to get fun. I'm sure that we're all going to cram together one of these days, all those calls from the show. So uh, Ramona says, see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Like I said, tomorrow we are doing that last of the online seminars for DAX, but you still have a chance to get in if you go in today. So if that's something you're looking for, go ahead and do that. Uh, Christine says, don't forget to mention the cocktail party. Now I can't remember the time. If you go to tworegularguys.com slash party, tworegularguys.com slash party tonight, there's a decorators cocktail party. It's a Zoom party you can get invited to. I believe there's only 100 people there. I may or may not manage to be there myself, but it's usually a good deal of fun with everybody hanging out and talking shop and just talking and chatting and getting together in this time when we're all separated. So if you want to check that out, absolutely do that. And uh, Cindy says, I will try working on something soon. Seriously, I'll hold you to it. Please do. I would love people to try more stuff and to, if you see samples of mine, you want to try, try them and, and talk to me about it. I'm sure that I can share a little bit of the secret sauce. The thing is, there's no secret to that one. What is stitched in front of you is pretty much what there is. Love to see that stuff. And Frank says, thanks, creative episode, fantastic ideas. I am so glad if I brought you, brought you some creative ideas, um, what I would love, since I told you guys to do the ask, here's my ask. Um, if you liked the show, everybody out there, Share this with someone else who does machine embroidery. Share this with somebody in the decoration and apparel space and uh, tell them that you liked it. That's my ask because I like to think I'm doing a creative piece here too. Hopefully I'm doing something that's worthwhile for you guys. And if I am, hey, share the value and share the love and let us have more people to join us on the take up. So with that, everybody, uh, get creative. Go out there and ruin some garments and stay strong and stitch on.